But there's four Gospels. We'll start there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those of you know that. Matthew written to the Jews with over 60 references to the Old Testament. It's a good segue if you're going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. <clears throat> I'm loud enough, right? I don't need that. Right? All right. Uh, it starts with the genealogy to Abraham. It's talking to a Jewish audience. It shows Jesus as the coming Messiah, the king of the Jews, the line of the tribe of Judah, the son of David. That term son of David is mentioned ten times. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is mentioned frequently. Uh, the next gospel, Mark, is written in quick snapshots, quick pictures. There's no genealogy as Jesus looks like a servant in that book. Um, and the genealogy of the servant is never traced. Uh, book, this, that book, Mark, emphasizes deeds more than uh, the words of Jesus. It seems to be written to a Roman audience immediately. The word immediately occurs more than 40 times in the book of Mark. Church tradition says that the main source was Peter. Uh, many believe the first gospel written around 50 AD. And... Uh, that's Mark. Luke. The son of Luke. <clears throat> Dr. Luke wrote that book. Probably the only New Testament that acts to be written by a Gentile. Uh, it was to write an orderly account, he says in this, to uh, Theophilus. I am very bad with names in the Bible, so just know that to begin with. I will butcher them left and right. Um, but the, the genealogy goes all the way back to Adam because in this book, the emphasis for Luke is the son of man. You hear that term frequently in that book. Uh, there was a wider audience, obviously, more than just Theophilus. Um, what's interesting about Luke is the opening verses <clears throat> are one sentence in original Greek when we look at the manuscripts. They're written, the opening of Luke, in a refined academic classical Greek. After that, he goes into what everyday man would speak. So he opens up with this beautiful picture of, hey, I can really, this, this guy's educated, right? He can really go into this educated look, but instead he reaches the average man. I love the way that Luke does that. Uh, he emphasizes in Luke prayer and the Holy Spirit that's emphasized throughout Luke. Um, and then we get to John. John is unique. The first three are called synoptic gospels. It means that uh, there's a, a synopsis, there's a total view that's given through those three. John is separate. Again, John doesn't start with a genealogy because it starts with Jesus being divine. <clears throat> and God has no genealogy. Likely the last written, uh, the fact being in mind as John wrote, that he understood when he wrote John that the other Gospels were already out there. This is why we believe John is so unique. Uh, it focuses more on who Jesus is than what he does. Um, what's interesting, when you look at the four Gospels, the four Gospels, if you look at Ezekiel 1.10, it says, it's talking about the creatures in, in heaven. And it says, as for the likeness, their faces each had the face of a man, and the four had a face of a lion on the right side, and the four had a face of an ox on the left side, and the four had a face of an eagle. So these creatures in heaven have four faces. We have one face, that would be really weird if we have four. But they have four faces, one on each side of their face. And what's interesting is you look at the Gospels, Matthew, lion, we have lion here, Mark, an ox, a servant, Luke, man, son of man, so there's your man, and then eagle, for the fourth one, we look at John. And actually in the, in the, uh, early church, they assigned those to the Gospels. So it's interesting how the Lord had prepped in the past, all the way back in Ezekiel's time, hundreds of years before the Gospels were written, about what was coming as we look at this total view of the Gospels. In John, there's seven miracles mentioned, six of them not in the other Gospels. There's the seven I am statements, very, very important. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. The seven I am statements that he gives. And uh, they're in fact, so it, it's actually what he's really saying is I am the only bread of life. I am the only light of the world. I am the one and only resurrection and the one and only life. I am the only good 
shadow. I am the only way, the only truth, and the only life. He's emphasizing that I am the only true vine. Over and over again, he's saying he is the way. Jesus is the way. That's it. There's no other way. All the other religions don't compare. They can't measure up because we have a God who came to us, right to us, right down to us. The divine God became man for us. He also says, uh, one of the I am statements is he'll to say before Abraham was, I am. This puts the Pharisees and all the lawyers into a tizzy and they get ready to stone him because they understand what he's claiming. He's claiming he is God. John likes to sum it up with, uh, at the end of the book. He says, and there's so many other things that which Jesus did, that if, which they should be written, everyone, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books written. John just wants to make this clarifying statement that there's more that Jesus did that we even see <clears throat> that's written here. He also, in John 20, 30-31, no, I just said that, sorry. So let's, in the, sorry, in 1 John, he talks about this. John wants to give the point that he has seen these things, right? So in 1 John, the epistle, I love this. This is how he starts 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that the eternal life, <clears throat> which was with the Father, and was manifested, manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message we have heard from all, and we declare to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness. The reason I read that is John's saying that this was something that was here. This is something that was physical. The, the Gnostics were going on at this time. When John starts to write, they were saying Jesus never came in physical form. He's making a clarifying statement to say Jesus was real. He was here in physical form. I've seen. I'm a witness. So he was just clarifying that. The book of John, the disciple of John, we'll talk about him for a little bit. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loves four times. I, I love that. Great phrase. Uh, this book is only written with about a variety of 600 different Greek words. The reason that's important is we only usually learn around 100 words a year. So it's written in a way that a six-year-old can understand the language. But it said, uh, one of the quotes I had, that stories are so simple that even a child will love them, but its statements are so profound that no philosopher can fathom them. Another one said, the Gospel of John is a beloved gospel because of its paradoxical combination of both simplicity and depth. John has been called a pool in which a child may wade and an elephant may swim. John himself was the brother of James. James was the first disciple martyr. They were known as the sons of thunder because they decided one day it would be better to call down fire. A uh, great story if you watch the chosen part where they fed really well. Um, he was one of the three that Jesus would take into his inner circle. That would be Peter, James, and John. I think he kept them close to keep him out of trouble if you follow these three guys. He would live a different life compared to the rest of them because he would live the martyrdom of a long, long life. By the time he gets to writing Revelation, all the disciples would have passed. In the beginning, he was one of 500 that witnessed and saw Jesus coming back. He would be one of the 120 that were sent out in power during Jesus' ministry. He'd be one of the 12 that were chosen by Jesus, Jesus himself. As I said, one of the inner circle of three, but by the end of their life, he would be one of one, and outlived all the rest of the disciples. It said that in church history that they would carry him around on a mat from church to church, and they would just bring him to the front. He was so old, and I, I also heard he had such a deep and rumbling voice that might be one of the other reasons they called him the Son of Thunder. They would bring him up front and he would just say, little children, love one another. And he would say, I have nothing deeper to teach you than that. And then they would carry him to the back. This, this great apostle of love, from, the, from a son of thunder to the apostle of love he was known as. Um, he also would say, he, he seemed to have this thing for light. And I, I really like that. I started to read him all about light this week and then I realized this is way beyond my understanding. So I kind of gave up after a while. 
But it's interesting the effects that light can have on us, right? And uh, a friend when we were over in England not long ago, he was saying because it gets dark there so early, the sun doesn't come up till nine and is back down by ten o'clock during the winter months, or I'm sorry, like three o'clock during the winter months. He said that they bring light lamps into their work so people can work because their mood changes. People fall into depression without light. It's interesting. John always talking about light in 1 John 2, 9 through 10, he says, he who is, says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness unto him. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Interesting, this son of thunder would also write, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The radical change that John went through in the beginning of his ministry to wanting to fall down fire from heaven to burn up the Samaritans till the end of his life where he's he is the one known for writing, God is love. So let's take a look at these verses as we dig through this. <clears throat> if you don't have a Bible, we do not see extra ones. So I'm going to read down through, then we'll back up and we'll go right down through the Gospel of John. <clears throat> We're going to read down verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the light was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, and the glory as the only one begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This opening line, in the beginning, was the word. It's such an amazing statement when you begin to look at this. In the beginning, every Jew's ears would perk up, because we know Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created. Here it's in the beginning, so the Jews' ears would perk up. The interesting thing is the word, word, that's in that place, word, word. Um, it means logos, it's the spoken word. There was a philosophy behind it, so this first statement, these first few words are going to grab the Jew and they're going to grab the Greek right there. Word meant to them, it was, it was a Greek way of thinking. It was like, it is the thinker behind the thought that is divine. That's how they would kind of interpret it. One of the things I read talked about how an object, such as this table, and this is just their philosophy, I'm not saying this is right, but this table has always existed. The reason it's always existed is because somebody thought of the table. But there was a thought behind that. There's a thinker behind that thought that had always existed. So therefore, the table has always existed. Bizarre way of thinking, but John is putting someone to that thinker behind it all. That behind all of that is the word and its person. So he's taking that philosophy and saying, there's more to this than you guys think. There is a divine being. So again, this first, in the beginning, was the word. It's going to grab the Jew and the Greek right off the bat. <clears throat> but it's emphasizing Jesus is God, right? We could replace the word, word, <laughs> with Jesus. So it could be in the beginning with Jesus. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Jesus was in the beginning with God. People stumble all over this. The cults today like to abuse this. Uh, they actually add the word A. So they would read it, in the beginning was the word, and then the word was with God, and the word God. The Jehovah Witnesses say it like that. The Mormons run with that too. What's interesting about that is the people that they credit for saying that, um, let me find the guy's name, Dr. Manley, who they have the uh, Watchtower published saying this is the guy who said this, that it should say a word, is a scholar. He actually wrote them. We have those letters. He demanded that they remove him from that because of his false information. The other person they, they quote is named Jonas Reber, and Reber wasn't even a, a, at all studying um, 
the Greek at all. He had no, he wasn't a biblical Greek scholar. That's the word I'm looking for. He was an occult practicing spiritualist. So he took this and ran with it. And that's their sources. That's the two sources that they say that where it says, and the word was a God. We know that that's not true. We know Jesus is the God. And I put Psalms 92 because before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God existed before everything that was. Jesus was there before everything was. And just to re uh, emphasize that point. And it says that he was in the beginning with God. I think verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. For their thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in, all, in, in him all things consist. That the very makeup of life was, was Jesus. He created life. What's interesting, I was listening a little bit this week too about cells, right? The way our cells develop. That all the DNA that you need is in one of your cells. But nobody understands why that cell becomes a fingernail cell. Or why it becomes a skin cell. Or why it becomes an organ cell. One, one medical uh, analyst said, it says that there's a director behind all these cells telling them what to become. And you just laugh at this kind of stuff because you're like, yeah, we know who the director is. We know who's behind this. This is Jesus. He's directing all things. He's behind all of this. I love that. And he continues to stumble the scientific community over and over again, and they get to a point where they're like, none of this makes sense. There's a story Joe Ochoa tells of a physicist who was studying, and he came to the conclusion that most of everything is just space. Right? Like if you took all the space out of the earth, it would be the size of a basketball. So if you just took all the space out of all the elements, it would just be, it would still be the same weight, but it would be the size of a basketball. And he couldn't wrap his mind around how we all existed. And he said, it says, if we're all thoughts in the mind of God. And he eventually committed suicide. He couldn't handle that. Like how, how we're here, how we function. We know how we function. We, we are in the mind and the thoughts of God. We are the thoughts of the word. <clears throat> So Jesus also says that, that he was the life, and the life was the light of men. And he would say over and over again, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He, he who believes in me may die, he shall live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, these are always in fact. He is making a point. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life, again, I'm just going to reiterate it. I am the only resurrection. I am the only life. And then, and then he who believes only in me, though he may live, he shall, or, though he may die, he shall live. And John 14, 6, I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. And then to reiterate, no one comes to the Father except for me. He's, it is an exclusive statement. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that we reach the Father. <clears throat> Jesus is the light. I love, I love this thing about the light. Um, I looked up, I was just, if you use Blue Letter Bible, which I encourage you all to do if you're a Bible study here at all, and you just type in a word, it will show you everywhere in there that that word is mentioned through the Bible. And I was doing that with light, and I was just looking around, and I came across Revelation 21, 23. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in, for the glory of God illuminated, and the Lamb is your light. But then if you go to Isaiah 60, 19, the sun no more will be your light by day, nor will your brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. The word Lord there is, is the Yahweh, or Jehovah, Y-H-E-H. -E what it's saying is when you take these two verses side by side, it's very clear that the light is the Lamb, the light is Yahweh. Obviously, the conclusion would be Yahweh is Jesus. Jesus is Yahweh. Again, the cults run with this stuff. They, they abuse it. And when you begin to dig down and look at the stuff, it's all just a lie to confuse us. I like where it says that the darkness, it depends what version you have. The darkness um, doesn't understand or doesn't overcome the two versions um, that people translate. The word comprehend is a Greek verb. It's not easy to translate. 
contains the idea of laying hold of something so to make it its own. This can lead meanings like lay hold with the mind and thus comprehend. The verb we discussed has rather than sufficiently attested meaning overcome. It is that is required here. So what all that to say that really this word should be overcome. The, the darkness cannot overcome the light. I remember back in the day, I don't know if you all remember the no fear shirts, right? They were really popular every morning. I had one that was fear not, it was like the Christian version, and it said, how fast does darkness flee? The speed of light, right? So you turn on the light, the darkness flees. We wonder why the world is so dark, it's because the world is rejecting Jesus. And as it rejects Jesus, it invites darkness. You see that constantly at work. I, I look at all these people I work with, and I'm like, what, what are you guys doing? You, like, you don't make sense. Like, this is opposite world to me now. I, right is wrong, and wrong is right. People can choose what they are, and they can do all kinds of crazy things, and, and you think you're good, but you're not. You're, you're walking in darkness, and then, I, then you talk to them for a while, and they're all struggling with anxiety, struggling with depression, just sulking it and hurting so deeply. And then I try to talk to them about Jesus. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's weird. And I'm like, but don't you see the difference? Like, and they do. They always say it to me. They, they shoo me away when they're starting to do bad jokes and everything. Like, get, get, get mad out of here. We can't have anyone out here for this discussion. It was actually said to me this week. But there's, there's that. What, what does light and darkness have to do with each other? We are to remain separate from the world. Uh, First Corinthians on the bottom of the screen there, 6.14. Do not be under equally yoked together. For what fellowship does righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with dark? We are to remain separate. We should look different. And as the world gets darker, our light should shine brighter. And we know that's supposed to be. As you read scripture, as you understand, it's supposed to get darker. It's, and it's going to get a lot darker. And that's why we need more of this. We need more church. We need more churches that teach the word and are going to go through it. As I looked through this and I looked at Jesus, and we get to um, verse 10 where it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. I just sat there and I thought about it for a while. Nobody is more misunderstood than God. And it, when Jesus was man, when he was Jesus is man, but as a man and as God, he has all of the attributes. So I was just, you know, thinking that through. Jesus was rejected. He was betrayed. And it had to have an emotional toll. I don't really see it that much. But it had to have an emotional toll on him to be betrayed like that. And I, 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 mean, I think through those things, and it says in the, the scripture that God can be grieved, that he can grieve the Holy Spirit, right? There's a deep emotion with God. And I think as we reject it, as it's misunderstood, it hurts him. And I never thought of that that way before. Um, it's, it's like being the parent that just wants to correct the kid. And you're trying to correct the kid. You're trying to teach them the right thing. Like, stop eating candy. It's not good for you. You're going to be sick. And they, why do you hate me? Why are you against me? Why are you treating me like this? Because I know what's better. And our, our Heavenly Father is the same thing. He reaches down to us. He's trying to give us a better, a, a better life, a Zoe life, the abundant life uh, that's mentioned in some of these verses. And instead, we slap his hand away continuously. And, and in that, there has to come a point where justice has to be done. Right? That, that God is perfect, so therefore he will execute perfect justice at some point. But it's not his heart to do that. If you look at any part of the Bible, we were talking this week, I was talking with the young guy this week, where God pours out judgment, like on Sodom and Gomorrah, where in, in, in the book of Revelation, there's a delay, right? There was a delay when he when he pulled people out. He, he wasn't pouring it all out. If God wanted to, he could snap his fingers and we're all wiped out, right? But even in his judgment, there's time. There's time given. His hope is that we repent. Scripture says over and over again, his hope is that all believe as we go down and look through these things. Um... And one thing is, as we look about at light and talk about light, you are the light of the world. Jesus would say on the very famous sermon on the mountain, the city that is on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 
We are to reflect the Father. We are to reflect the love of Jesus. They should look at us and say, what's different? I love uh, a story, I was in a lot of good books. Uh, he told over and over again, there was a, a woman, older woman who got saved and began attending church. The father was a, uh, but her husband was a very cross guy, just kind of mean, one of those mean, crotchety old men that, you know, just glare at you all the time. And he got ill. And it was back there where you had to change storm windows out. And in the summer, you take the screens out and the storm windows in. Well, the church came and changed all the storm windows out because he was sick. He was in bed. And uh, he, they came and they were helping her clean the house and do all the things that he usually did. And he goes, what is this? What are these people? Why do they love me this way? I do anything with that. I don't even really like them in my house. He goes, if I get better, I'm going to go to that church. And he, of course, he got better and got saved and went to that church. But that's how our love should look like that. That light of the Father, that we're willing to sacrifice self for others. That's what true love looks like. It's not what the world calls love because they don't even really understand love. They think it's it's an indulgence of pleasure where it's opposite. Sometimes it's sacrificing self for another. That's what true love looks like. If you want to see true love, look at the cross. <clears throat> that was a complete side note I didn't have in my notes at all. Um, and we have John 3.16, of course. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave him the only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The, the profoundness, again, simple words we know over and over and over again, but the profoundness of all these words, that there is a God who loves us. That there, on the contrary to that, there is a world in darkness. What God will do for love is sacrifice his own son. And then the cost to us is what? It's believing. Which, what it comes down to, it's not really even a cost at all. Just to go back a little bit, I, I think when God reiterates um, the rejection in his heart, you know, you see in Psalm uh, 118, 22, it's over and over again throughout Scripture where it says, The stone of the builder is rejected as the as the world rejects, there's no foundation, right? That's another way to say that, too, that there's no foundation that's outside of the Lord, and that's why they're in this chaos and needing light. As many as received him, I love, the, I love that line, they give you right to be called the children of God. The idea of that children of God makes an affectionate term. It's, it's, there, there's a lot of uh, emotion in that love, that goes to the expression of love. The, when John would go around on that mat over and over again, that I said in the beginning, carries the church to church, little children love one another. There was, there was a lot of emotion in that to say, you're mine now. And that's what Jesus says to us. That's what John was saying. You, you are his little children love. <clears throat> And that's what we're to be doing, to, be, to give love, to give off life, to show and reflect the love of God. I went really, really fast. <laughs> um, I'm, but I'm thankful you guys are here. I, I hope and pray that God does amazing things here. And um, this is a very dark area Alan and I were talking about. And we are called to be light. And that costs us something. But I pray as it gets darker and as we have to stand stronger, that we can be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And no matter what, if you throw me in this fire, that's fine. I'm still not going to bow my knee. Because what they did is they understood who God was. And no matter what the cost, I will stand for God. Because I'm not looking for him to do. I'm looking to stand for him because I love him for him. I don't need him to do anything for me. I don't, I don't care about how this develops, but what I want to see is God do a work. We want to see people saved. We want to see them come to him. And whatever that cost that may be, it's worth it because it's not about God doing something. It's about God reaching people because of who he is, because of his great love for them. So, I'm kind of done. 
But I wanted to be a little shorter today, too, um, just because I didn't know how the setup was going to go. I didn't know how this was all going to work out. Um, so the plan is we're going to go through all the way through John, verse by verse, line by line, um, and then just keep going right through the New Testament. John, Acts, Romans, maybe maybe after Romans or 1st, 2nd Corinthians, we'll go back and maybe do Mark or Matthew and then come back and uh, see what the Lord will do. So uh, let's just pray and then Jeff will come up and sing one last song. Father, thank you for being that light, that light of the world. Thank you for you, Lord, for who you are, for your great love for us, uh, for the gift of your Son, Lord, and we desire for people here to come to know you. We desire, desire for nature's birth to have revival, Lord. We need that. Um, we know that's in your heart. May we, Lord, be that light. May you reflect through us this week. May you show yourself strong in our life. May we be willing to Die to flesh daily, Lord, as needed. Show us uh, how we can serve you better, how we can love you more, Lord. And uh, just thank you again for this time, for this place, Lord. It was miraculous.